Stand with me, please. We want to read from the Gospel of Mark together, chapter 10. And where we're reading here, we're just over a week from the crucifixion of Jesus. He's been ministering for three years, and his disciples are clueless what's about to happen. But he's just about a week from his death. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So, as we are heading toward Easter, we call this season Lent, and it's a wonderful time to let God do a reset. So, I, I was riding with a, a farmer a, as he was combining his field, and he said, let me show you something, and he just took his hands off his, his steering wheel, and the combine drove itself across the field. It's a big robot is all it is. And he, he did have to turn when he got to the end of the field, but then he, then he was able to just sit back and relax again. So I said, so what, you know, I said, Dave, what's changed? Because he was about 70. I said, you know, what are the big changes that you experience in farming? And he said, well, some mornings the GPS satellites get out of sync and I have to resync them in the morning so that the, the combine will know how to drive across the field. Farming is going crazy. But he has to resync his combine GPS with satellites thousands of miles away. Well, you and I need to resync sometimes. Our soul needs a resync. And that's a wonderful opportunity with Lent. So, one thing that we're doing on our Wednesday evenings, we are considering ways that we're lost. Because Jesus is the perfect one to find us. He is the perfect savior, the perfect rescuer. So on Wednesday evenings, as we've been thinking about how we're lost, we, the last couple Wednesdays, that lower canvas there, we had eight different colors of paint, and we listed eight kinds of temptations, and we asked everybody to think about, what's a temptation that you struggle with? And everybody chose one and, and marked something on the canvas. And I saw people in, in dis, deep discussion as they were, were coming up to the painting, trying to figure out, where do I need God to help me? And we're not doing this to be cute. I've, I've had people well, sitting and talking with me since that night, telling me about stuff they've been struggling with for years. It's opened up opportunities for people to talk about how they need God's help. And then last week we talked about something else. You know, how does how has sin messed up our world? Well, it brings in sickness. It brings in chronic pain. It brings in disease. So that top canvas, we, we put band-aids on that. And when I first thought about that, somebody suggested it, and I thought, I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but Last Wednesday, it surprised me as I, as I just chose one of the band-aids and put it on the canvas. I realized, God has really helped me. He's really, he's rescued me from some bad stuff that's going on in my life. So it's 
So Wednesday nights are a great opportunity to remind your, ourselves that we are not only lost, but we can be found. Jesus is this perfect Savior. And we want to think about this perfect Savior this morning. Jesus is identified in this passage. He says he's the servant, but he's also the Savior. He's the rescuer. He's the hero. And he invites us into this. We see that Jesus is the only rescuer. We read, he said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We read out of Isaiah this morning, Cindy did, God saying, there is no other Savior. God is the only Savior. You can't go manufacture another one. You may read news, you know, magazine articles saying there's other ways, but it's only God. We are only saved through Jesus Christ. We read in Hebrews that Jesus died as a ransom to set us free. And I can't think of anything more terrifying than being somebody who needs a ransom. Because if you need a ransom, what kind of situation are you in? You've been kidnapped. That would be awful. And the scripture tells us that that's where every one of us have been. We've needed this rescuer to set us free from sin. And, and we get this mixed up in our world. We, we end up substituting cheap saviors. So back in 2015, there was a presidential campaign going on. And Hillary Clinton was coming to New Hampshire for a campaign rally. And this lovely group of people decided to take a Negro spiritual and change one word. So the song was supposed to be, woke up this morning with my mind staying on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind staying on Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And you know what they sang? They changed Jesus to Hillary. Hillary Clinton, maybe she would have made a great president, but she's not my savior. And if you go a few miles northwest of town, you'll find a, a great big sign, and it says, only God and Trump can save us now. Maybe Donald Trump would be a great president, but he's not going to save your soul. He can't do that. We get politics, we, we overvalue what a politician can do. We need God. God can use politicians, but we need Jesus. And there's a pastor named Lon Solomon. He served a church by Washington, D.C. called McLean Bible Church. And he grew up in a Jewish family. He said that every Friday evening we had Sabbath candles or Shabbat candles, and they would light them and have a special meal together, and he would pray. But he was not finding any connection with God. So when he was 14 or 15, he started chasing into drinking and partying and using girls, and he got his life all messed up. And he left the synagogue, and he finished high school, so he thought, well, at college, that's where life will get good. So he enrolled in the University of North Carolina, and he got big into partying. But he discovered his freshman and sophomore years that, you know, drinking and girls aren't enough. So he decided, what I need is drugs. So his junior year, he got into drugs, and he quit going to class, and he took to sitting in trees and smoking dope. Isn't that why we go off to college? I hope not. So he went into business. He was an entrepreneur selling drugs. And he was feeling lost. So he, he experimented with Taoism and Confucianism and Buddhism. And then he thought, I need help. Maybe I need to see a rabbi. He said, I felt good that I was a Jew, but there was nothing that could deal with where my soul was hurting. There was nothing that could change me. I decided I was going to kill myself. I didn't have any money for a gun. I didn't know where to get poison, but I turned him that I was going to do it. And then there was a crazy guy on the edge of campus 
that would, had his car covered with stickers about Jesus, and he'd show up every Saturday, and he'd just stand there for hours talking to people about Jesus. And Lon met him, and he, he kept coming back to him week after week over months. And God used this crazy guy to turn Lon's life around, and he found Jesus. And it changed his whole life. But in finding Jesus, he lost his family. They cut him off. He he said, my grandmother and mother wouldn't even talk to me for several years. But Jesus is a perfect savior. He is what is essential. But when we look at this passage, we see Jesus in a strange conversation with his disciples. You know, there's 12 disciples, and two of the first guys are James and John. And we don't know if it's their idea, if you read one of the other Gospels, it could be that their mother wanted to elevate them a little bit. We don't know who it started with, but they come to Jesus with this fabulous idea. Jesus, we want to be your number one and number two. Teacher, we want you to do for us Whatever we ask, when, when you get promoted to king, because we think you're going to go to Jerusalem, we're on our way to Jerusalem, I think you're going to take over the whole country and make one of us the guy on your right, make the other one of us the guy on your left, we will we'll have your back, put us in charge. What a great idea. <laughs> or not. And then the other ten disciples hear about it. What's their response? The scripture says they were indignant. Indignant is not just a little bit unhappy. Indignant is when you're really mad about it and you can't shut up about it and you will not let it go. They're indignant. And Jesus has to step in at this point because this is a problem. And he has to tell them, I don't make side deals. There is no Jesus if. There's no Jesus, I will follow you if you do this for me. Jesus, I will follow you if you take care of my life the way I want it this way. There's a a pastor in a church we're connected to out in Montana. His name is John Bent. He wrote, I was 23 years old when the Lord confronted me in a way not unlike the Apostle Paul. Although I had known the Lord from my childhood, I had never seriously considered what his will might be for my life. I figured that if I gave the Lord a token 10% and went to church when I could, he would leave me alone. What a childish, foolish young man I was. His words to me that night on the Boulder River in southern Montana were unmistakable. John, time is short. There is much work to be done, and you have been wasting time. God was absolutely right. I had accomplished my will. Graduated with a degree in wildlife management from Montana State University. Had a beautiful girl, not my wife Grace, ask me to marry her and was ready to start working on my master's degree in wildlife research, yet I was so empty. And to put it bluntly, he says, I was wasting time. And the Lord confronted me. His heart told him, you never asked me, John, what I wanted you to do with your life. And God was absolutely right. I couldn't imagine that following the Lord would end in the fulfillment I was seeking. How wrong I was. How can you know what you don't know? Or maybe, how can you let go of what you think you know but don't? I decided to pursue Jesus and find out what he wanted to do with my life. I left the mountains, enrolled in Bible school. I opened my heart to learn from God, and I discovered the joy of being used by the Lord. Instead of singing for cows, I began to sing for Jesus. Now, I don't know if you sing for cows or not. I know a couple people here who maybe sing for their sheep, but I found his word to be the bread of life. I discovered I had skills to teach. I met the true love of my life, God's grace incarnate. And then John Bent concludes, here's the point. Following Jesus will always take you somewhere you've never been before. 
Following Jesus will always take you somewhere you've never been before. That place is always better than where you are or where you came from. It's never an easy road, but it's the road that leads to life, abundant life, joy, and fulfillment the world can't understand or give. Jesus is a perfect Savior. And he won't make you a side deal because you would be cheating yourself if he let you have what you have thought you wanted. He has something even better. He has something even better. There's no Jesus if. There's Jesus, I'm all yours. Jesus is the perfect Savior. And the other thing Jesus tells us here is that he's looking for servants. He's pretty pointed about this. We read that those who regarded, Jesus says, those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. And our world ranks people in a pretty degrading way. You, you, you find yourself never measuring up to somebody else that you're thinking about. And so here's one way that I was thinking about it, because it, it was a funny thing living out in S Southern California and being surrounded by mansions and mega mansions. And I thought, God, what are you doing in my life? So he here's, here's what I wrote one day to myself. Just thanking God for where he's put me and how he's using me. There is little life under spotlight, small joy on red carpet, shallow mirth in mansions, a vacuum of peace behind guarded gates. But I have tasted sweet hospitality in the hovel of refugees, in the smoke of a gritty kebab shop, at the table of a martyr's widow, I have not dined under a Michelin star, but I've picnicked high on a Karimabad cliffside under snow-capped mountain peaks. I've not resided in Washington, D.C., but I have flourished in a much safer capital, Bismarck, North Dakota. I have not flown Air Force One, but I've piloted wings from green grass into glorious blue. I have not booked appointments in Munich, Vienna, or Oslo, but I have been blessed by my neighbors in Mona, Ventura, and Ortley. I never studied in St. Petersburg, but I received superb teaching in St. Ansgar. I've not graduated in Paris, but I was privileged to earn a certificate in Peshawar. I do not teach in Cambridge, but I learn with my students in Camrose. I've been embraced in God's great places by our planet's most precious people, far from headlines, Unburdened by celebrity and power, touched by goodness, beauty, truth, and love. Richly blessed under a multitude of stars. Really doesn't matter where we're, we're from, does it? And it really doesn't matter where we are as long as God has put us there, as long as we're following him. My oldest brother Nathan is with us this morning. And I don't know why, but I remember a line from your high school graduation speaker. That was a few years ago. His high school graduate, this was in St. Ansgar, Iowa, about 100 miles east of here. And he said something like, never be ashamed of your hometown. Always be proud of where you came from. And there are people that grow up and all they want to do is go somewhere else. Life will be better if I get out of... Here, <laughs> wherever here is. But Jesus can use you where you are. Jesus uses us wherever he plants us. I mean, that phrase, bloom where you are planted, it's true. It's not just true at Dell's Garden Center. It's true. Jesus says, I'm looking for servants. I want to richly bless you under a multitude of stars He'll surround you by precious people. You don't need celebrity or power. Jesus is looking for servants. 
I read a story, and it's one of these stories that I hope is true. I'm not sure if it actually is. I read a, about a seminary where when the students were seniors, they came to take their last test, and the professor told them, this test is a must-pass test. If you do not pass this test, you will not become a pastor. You will not graduate. And 50% of this test is the final question. And the final question was, who is the custodian at our seminary? As the idea was, if you have not had the human interest to get to know this person who has taken care of this facility for you for the last four years, how could God ever use you as a pastor? God needs servants. He doesn't need more great people. He doesn't need more rich people. He doesn't need more smart people. He needs servants. You and me. And that's why God has called us. I told you just a little bit about Lon Solomon, that pastor. His mother cut him off. His grandmother cut him off. He says at one family gathering, my uncle picked me up physically and threw me out after I had become a Christian. My grandfather didn't talk to me for seven years. My uncle didn't talk to me for 10. They wouldn't even say hello on the telephone. He writes, my father was the hardest man I ever met. If I brought up spiritual things, he would leave the room or turn up the volume on the TV. He was in the hospital in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I, he was in for hepatitis. My mom, in her melodramatic way, had me thinking he was dying, so I went to see him really quick. Father... His father said, Lon, I've been doing a lot of thinking lately. I've been coming around to think that maybe all this stuff you've been telling us about Jesus the Messiah, being the Messiah might be right. I said, Dad, I'm absolutely convinced of it, but why are you saying this? I don't understand. You've never been interested. His dad said, I'm getting near death. And I decided I could find in Orthodox Judaism what you had found in Jesus. I started going every week to synagogue. Just recently, I went to the high holiday services, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. I was there to get some kind of assurance. And I said to myself as I walked out the door, there's no assurance here. There's lots of ritual, and there's lots of good content, but there's no assurance. I don't know anything more about where I'm going when I die than when I walked in here. That's when I began saying, maybe Lon's right. And Lon says, I told him, Dad, think about this overnight. And the next morning, Lon came back to visit his dad in the hospital. And Lon says, my dad crawled out of his hospital bed, this hard, hard man. And he got down on his knees beside me. And he ate, prayed and asked Jesus to come in and change his life. A week later, he had had a trachea installed couldn't talk, so he could communicate just by pointing at letters on a, a little board. And he spelled out, L Lord and Jew. He, and Lon says, he was telling me, I have found Jesus as my Lord, and I'm still a Jew. And he had his last, he had his fourth heart attack, and he died. Jesus is the perfect Savior. And we just have to throw ourselves completely on him. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you that there's no sin beyond your forgiveness. There's nothing that we have done to mess up our lives that you can't restore. Lord, you take our messes and you turn them in to something beautiful. We don't know how you do that, but we thank you that you do. And Jesus, we open our hearts wide. We say thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your new life. You died for us and you rose again. And we are grateful to be your children. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.